right. Well, my name is Johan, and I will try to explain today why it is important to know the genetic courses of CNM. This picture is of our institute. It shows that we are sitting a bit in the middle of nowhere, and that's partly true. We're south of Strasbourg in a typical um, French-named village of Ilkirch Grafenstaden. The IGM BMC is one of the greatest um, research institutes in Europe. We do some foundational research as well, and that's so high class that we get um, high class visitors like this young gentleman. We will reduce his size a little bit. The real stars came over here. This is Emil with his mom and dad who asked lots of questions. And Michael, the experimentator, came around. Despite the laws against child labor in France, I have used his knowledge. So those are the real VIPs that came around. Our team is consists of about 20 people. And what we work on in our team is congenital myopathies. I prefer to call it structural uh, myopathies so that everybody can understand what we talk about. Myopathies can affect children and adults alike. Um, and it occurs in about one of 25,000 cases. There are different types of these muscular, of these myopathies. So as soon as biopsies are available, we can color the muscle, um, and that is called histology. From this histology, we can define the type of disease. The first uh, staining, the first coloring, this is called um, tubular aggregate myopathy. Um, the middle one is called central core disease, and the picture on the bottom is something that you probably know. If the cores, if the um, nuclei are in the middle, then this is called central nuclear myopathy. There are different types of CNM, and if we look at them, we find further information in the histology. For example, our main focus is on CNM, central nuclear myopathies, that are that regard um, generic myopathies, muscle weaknesses. Often there are also difficulties in breathing, and there are certain details in every case that help us define what disease is actually the case. On MTM1 cases, a lot of the time, not always, but a lot of the time, you see some of these fibers called necklace fibers. That is very typical of MTM1 cases. For RYR1 cases, maybe you can see it over here. There are little uh, clear areas that are not as dark as the rest. It looks like a mixture um, of CCD and uh, RYR. And it is true that there is some kind of mixture between these two diseases. In BIN1 cases, there are not only central nuclear, um, central nuclei, but rather nuclear clusters as well. And finally, in DNM2 cases, you can see that there are small and large fibers, where in between there are little bridges, or spoke of wheels, as we call them. These are the most typical cases of CNM that we see on a regular basis, where from the biopsy we can know roughly this could be this type of disease and the other. We are also often asked why are the nuclei located in the middle? We honestly don't know yet. There are also a lot of titine cases, but there is no classical um, anamnesia that takes place. 
We don't know 100 percent why the cores, why the nuclei are in the middle, but we do know that muscle development is strongly influenced by them. Here you can see it, muscle development, the development of cells, cell nuclei, and there is a fusion of different muscular cells, hundreds of thousands get together and build a muscular tube. In this tube, the nuclei are located right in the middle, and after maturation, a muscular fiber is developed. And in this development, the nuclei move to the side. If you cut through muscle fibers, you see that the nuclei are located on the sides. But in the case of CNM or MTM, you see that the fibers surround the nuclei completely. It looks a bit like you had cut through a muscular tube, the central image on top. That is why it's called myotubular myopathy. It looks like an unmatured tube. Let's look at one of the detail. What do the what do the, um, the nuclei, even um, the, the genes, how are they involved in this development? In this part, you see the T tubuli. They are like caves in the muscular fiber. They activate a receptor. This receptor is a calcium channel. It sits on a little depot of calcium. We will get to that a bit later, but this calcium store sits on top of filaments. This is where titin is involved. These, when these filaments strain, then the whole channel is activated. The calcium goes out of the store into the filaments, and that's how it reacts to a um, strain. We can see, therefore, that this is all part of the development of a muscle. As we know, the structure of genes um, determines the function. Only if the organization takes place in the correct order, the muscle can work in the correct way. In 1996, a young PhD student, um, Jocelyn Laporte, came and found out about MTM1. In the past 20 years, he has spent a lot of time and energy to build up a team. We are one of the greatest teams in IGBMC. And even that large that we have split up into three different groups. In the work groups, we look from the beginning to the biological understanding up to the level of therapy. So we continue the complete development. I personally am responsible for molecular diagnosis and the genetic causes of structural muscle um, development issues. When we have found out about the genetic causes, we go to Anne Sophie and she helps us understanding biologically why a certain gene causes a myopathy. And she looks at what happens inside of a cell. And when Anne Sophie has worked on the biological uh, understanding, then Belinda works on the therapeutic ways of how we can handle um, CTM. You can see that our team covers the entire path. When, for example, you don't know the beginning, the, the genetic causes of a disease, then we don't un we, we're not able to understand the disease, and that's why we cannot build a therapy around it. So we need to talk a little bit about genetics. We remember from high school that there are chromosomes. Uh, DNA is organized in chromosomes. 
There are 22 pairs of chromosomes. The very large ones are chromosome one. It all goes down, down to the sexual chromosomes X and Y. Every chromosome is double, one from mom and one from dad. These double genes are called alleles. For example, looking at chromosome 11, you see that the gene is located both on dad's and mom's chromosome. When I tell you now that DNA is made out of chromosomes, this is all about genetics. I try to find out where are faults in DNA that are responsible for disease. I try to read the DNA of a patient. I read the DNA like I was reading a book. You can compare reading DNA like reading a book. Um, but DNA is the entire book. Chromosome can be seen as a chapter. 46, 46 individual chromosomes make up DNA. And inside of these chapters, so to say, there are the genes. The genes are like sentences inside of a chapter. And the parts of genes are codons. The codons are made out of words C, D, A, G. Those are the letters that make up a codon. This is my favorite, um, <laughs> my favorite analogy, comparing DNA with a book. I like Can't Follow It a lot. I, I loved um, Fall of the Titans. It's a fantastic book. It has about one million letters because one night I couldn't sleep and I started counting. So there are roughly one million letters inside Can't Follow It's book. In DNA, we have around six billion letters. That is about the same as 6,000 books by Can't Follow It. So for every single patient where I try to find out about the DNA, I have to read 6,000 books of Can't Follow It to find out the reason, the cause for the disease. Somewhere in this library, there is somewhere, somewhere there's a book where there's a chapter or a sentence or a word where there's one single typo. This is the typo that causes the disease. And that's called a mutation, a typo in the DNA. It's not easy to find. That is why I'm there to um, find the mistakes. The question is, how can you find out about these mutations? This isn't easy because here, for example, you see one page of DNA. There are about 3,000 letters. And I have two million pages like this one, where I have to look and search for DNA mutations. To ease the way to the solution, I look at the family history. So family anamnese, am, anamnese um, helps me to look where I can find the faulty chromosome. A very typical example is this, the, where the, the grandparent has a faulty element in his DNA, um, and then the child has it as well. This is X-linked mutation or inheritance, which is passed on from the parent's side, the, the, the male side. When this goes, when the chromosome is passed to Marge, on Marge's level, um, we don't have any symptoms because she can compensate with her healthy chromosome. So when you see that mainly males um, suffer from this disease, then it is easy for me because I can just look to the wards, the X chromosome, and forget about all the rest. What is very important here is that the daughters of Marge, Lisa and Maggie, can be healthy but still pass on the disease with a chance of about 50%.
They can be healthy carriers. This can be difficult when they want to have children one day. Another example is on this page. Here, obviously, males and females um, are both affected. Here it is not so easy to find out which chromosome is at risk. But on this level, we can um, identify the DNM2 gene as being a bit at fault. Should I speak faster? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So every chromosome exists double, so chromosome number 19 exists twice, and it's enough to have one mutation in one of the genes that solves, that, that um, makes the disease evolve. This type of mutation can happen de novo, can happen spontaneously. It's not necessary to have this carried on by a parent. That means that here, for example, Lisa has a chance of 50% to pass this disease on to her children. The last example I'm going to show you is that the grandparents are not um, affected, and the, it's, this is called recessive carrying on, where BIN1, RYR1, and TTN are affected. Um, and this is called a healthy carrier. The grandparents are healthy. Marge is also healthy, but it is possible that at this level there is one copy with a mutation which passes on the disease to Bard or Maggie. So this family anamnese helps me in my position to decide where to look first. Since the um, discovery of MTM1, s about 850 patients have been diagnosed, most of them in our institute, about 500 cases since 1996 for MTM1, 100 cases to the, in DNM2, um, 30 for TTN, and 10 in BNI1. I can call you, I can give you some new recent figures in France. We have roughly three new MTM1 cases per year and two new DNM2 cases per year. If you calculate this, and you look at the figures, you think that's a very high number, but in many cases there is a very low level of diagnosis. Probably most people who suffer from this disease don't have the ability to have a biopsy. If you count all these cases together, um, we can calculate 175 patients without molecular di diagnosis. So there are a lot of patients who are not able to get the right diagnosis because without molecular diagnosis, it is difficult to receive appropriate genetic counseling. We're not able to diagnose pre uh, prenatal um, diagnosis. We cannot develop a therapy if we have no prenatal diagnosis. If we know what the patient has, what kind of mutation, then we can start developing therapies. So finally, how can we find the genes? We don't read those books with our own eyes. This is our old sequencer that we've been using since five or six years. This was developed in 1985. It was incredible back in the day that people could sequence DNA. It was quite expensive because scanning one gene cost around 300 euro. But if you wanted to read 10, 20 or 100 genes, then all of a sudden this uh, raised the price a lot. And in 2008, there was a real revolution where the next generation sequencing machine was bought. 
it was possible that within a few weeks the entire genetic library of a patient could be read. Now we thought we can give every patient a full genetical diagnosis. This costs 1,000 euro for all the genes, which is still expensive, but less expensive than the old version. But with new methods, there are new challenges. The first person who had his entire genetic material read is James Watson, who is a Nobel Prize laureate. And we found out that his DNA has thousands of mutations. We wondered how can he have thousands of mutations. He's over 90 years old, a healthy man. And only then we understood that every one of us has many, many falls in his DNA, around 100,000. But those mutations are not responsible for um, illnesses, but mostly those are just polymorphisms. My nose is a bit big, my ears are long. Those are polymorphisms, just the changes between us. But in these, among these 100,000 falls, there can be just one mutation that causes a disease. This is the key mutation that we have to find out. It is therefore very important to find which one of all these typos from all these thousands of books of DNA is key. Unfortunately, I'm not able to go into more detail, but the aim that we have is that every patient can resort to molecular diagnosis, and only by doing this we can offer therapy. If among us there are people who don't have molecular diagnosis, then I would like to talk to you about very quickly about the MyoCapture program. This is a program that we have developed to give a molecular, um, molecular diagnosis for every patient. In this program, we have had 960 patients. Many of them have not been completely diagnosed, but to some extent, and we've been able to make the diagnosis of one third of the patients, which is a good number, but not good enough. I think we're on the right track, but we need to keep on going. Just get in touch with me if you're interested. There has to be a clinical examination. It has to be obvious that there is a CNM. Ideally, there has already been verification of the main DNA. This is a research program which is free of charge for patients. And our aim is to find new genes and new gene mutations. Of course, first of all, we need to find the faults in the main DNA elements. When we want to find a new gene, then this is very difficult and can take a lot of time. For example, 2010, we found a new gene um, that has just recently been published. Like I said, this is free of charge, but it is a research project. You can take part anytime you like. However, because it is a research project, there is no time frame, no result guarantee, and also I cannot give you any further information on other genes than the ones we're researching. This is it for me. Thank you very much. Um, we will hear Belinda in a second. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, but thank you for your attention.